Hi folks, welcome to the second part of the Chapter 1 Key Concepts Review for Math 521b. We're finishing up here with sequences and series, and we're looking at mainly geometric progressions. There are a few disclaimers at the bottom of the screen that you might want to look at. This is intended as a review following some classroom instruction, so if you're using this to teach yourself for the first time, I'd suggest that you check out the channel Martin's Math instead. Okay, let's dive in. A geometric sequence is one that increases or decreases through multiplication by a fixed amount, called the common ratio. Remember, for arithmetic stuff, it was addition by a fixed amount, and that was the common difference. Here we've got a common ratio, written r. So we have 2, 6, 18, 54 in the first sequence. What's happening? We're multiplying by 3. So we would say the common ratio is 3. In the next one, we have 2, negative 6, positive 18, negative 54. What's going on here? We're multiplying by negative 3. In the next one, we have 10, 5, 5 over 2, 5 over 4. Now, you might think that that's division by 2, and that's a fine way to explain it, but in terms of a common ratio, we would call it multiplication by a half. And then in the last one, we suspect that we're multiplying by root 2. I wonder if it works. Obviously, to get from the first term to the next, we're multiplying by root 2. Let's see. If I multiply by root 2 again, is that going to give us 6? Let's see, that would be 3 root 4 or 3 times 2. Oh yeah, it is a common ratio of root 2. So when they're difficult to pick out, there's a little property that we can exploit. Generally, the ratio is the n plus 1th term over the nth term, or most simply, the second term divided by the first. So if we took a look at this sequence, this last one, the second term was 3 root 2, the first term is 3, ah, there we go, the ratio is root 2. We're going to take a look at the general term for a geometric sequence in just a second, but we want to notice that the second term is just the first term times r. The third term would be the first term times r, that would make it the second term, times r again. Or the third term is t1 times r squared. Okay, and that pattern is going to continue. So. The fifth term would be t1 times r to the 4. Let's check out an example. We've got a geometric sequence that has a third term of 10 and a sixth term of negative 80. So we're going to try and come up with some way of equating those two things. The sixth term would be the third term. Now, if I times it by r, that would make it the fourth. r again, that makes it the fifth. r again, that makes it the sixth. Ah, so t6 is t3 times r cubed. t6, we know, is negative 80. t3, that's 10, times r cubed. And from there, we have a nice little equation with a single variable in it that we should be able to solve. I can divide both sides by 10. That gives me r cubed is negative 8. If I want to get r, then I just cube root both sides, and it gives me r is negative 2. Now we're going to find the value of the eighth term. And there are a bunch of ways we could set these, this up. Here's one of them. t8 might be the sixth term times r. That would make it the seventh times r again. Or t8 would be t6 times r squared. Okay, and this saves us from having to go back and find t1. Sixth term is negative 80. r squared, that's negative 2 squared. Be careful, negative 2 squared is a positive, so this is negative 80 times 4. The eighth term should be negative 320. And that's all without a formula. Now that we have some intuitive understanding of how geometric sequences work, let's take a look at the general term. So it's tn equals t1 times r to the n minus 1. Okay, so the power is 1 less than the term number you're interested in. If we want the 11th term in this sequence, 
Well, just like we did with arithmetic, let's catalog what we know. T1 is negative 3. The common ratio, I can see that it's negative 2, but if I weren't sure, I would take the second term and divide it by the first. Ooh, it's negative 2. We're looking for the 11th term. So T11 is going to be T1, which is negative 3, times R, which is negative 2, to the power of 11 minus 1. Let's put that in the calculator. So we've got negative 3 brackets, negative 2 to the power of, oop, need a bracket there, to the power of, don't put in 11 minus 1, put in 10. We get negative 3,072. Let's do another one. We want to find the exact value of the fifth term in this. So we've got T1 of 66. We've got a common ratio. I can see there that it's a third. Let me just double check. It would be second term divided by first. I know those are both even, so I could divide them by 2. So that's 11 over 33. Those are both divisible by 11. Common ratio is 1 third, and it helps for us to put it in uh, reduced form. Now what sometimes you'll see students do, and I'm going to put it in red because it's bad, not equal to 0.3. Boo. Keep it exact as a fraction. OK, now we're going to find the fifth term. So T5 is going to be T1, which is 66, times 1 third to the power of 5 minus 1. And let's do this without a calculator. So that's 1 third to the 4th. 1 to the 4th is just 1. 3 to the 4th is 9 times 9, or 81. So the exact value is 66 over 81. Now that whole thing, both of those are divisible by 3, so that can be reduced down into 22 over 27. And that is the exact value. One of the applications of geometric sequences and series is in percent increase and decrease. So here's the way I like to think about these. The common ratio is 100% plus the change percent, and then you express this whole thing as a decimal. Let's take a look at an example, and hopefully that will become clear as we go through. So we've got Jimmy. He's got a job that pays $47,000 in his first year. He's guaranteed a 3% raise every year. What's his salary in the fifth year? So I like to write this out. So this is $47,000 in year one, and then there'd be a year two, and a year three, and a year four, and a year five. Ah, we want the fifth year. What do we know? We know that the first term is 47,000 and the R. So let's use this idea. 100%. Now he's getting a raise, so it's going to be plus the 3%, which would be 103% or 1.03. And if you can go straight to the 1.03, Lovely. If not, this little hack might help. Okay, because every year he gets 100% of what he got before, plus he gets another 3%. Now we're ready to get down to business. We want T5, therefore N is 5. So T5 is going to be $47,000 times 1.03 ah, to the power of 5 minus 1. I put that in my calculator. 47,000 times 1.03. Once again, I do not put in 5 minus 1. Gives me 52,898.91 cents. And you might write a little sentence about that. He makes 
that much. Okay, another common application of percent growth or decay is in depreciation of something like a car. So a car loses value typically over time. The value of a car is currently 20,000 and is depreciating at a rate of 15% per year. So it's losing value. Find the value three years from today. Oh, when they put the from today or from now, this is when things could get a little sneaky. So that's why I always set this up. It's worth 20,000 now. It's worth something in one year. It's worth something else in two years. It's worth something else in three years. So sneakily, we're really looking for T4. Okay, because the first term is right now. That's different from the last one. It was salary in the first year, and we wanted fifth year, so that was T5. Here, it's three years from now, we're looking for T4. Let's catalog what we know. 20,000, R. Okay, this is percent change, so I'm going 100%, and it's losing value. So it's losing 15% of its value every year, meaning it's worth 85% as much. And the common mistake that students will make is they'll just put in 0.15. But that's not what R is. It still maintains 85% or 0.85 of its value every year. If we're looking for T4, then N is 4. And again, we just sub in. Okay, so times R to the power of 4 minus 1. I throw that into my calculator, and I'm going to get this value. Okay, so it's lost quite a bit of its value over those three years. Geometric series, that's the sum of the terms in a geometric sequence. There are two formulas. The one on the left is typically a little more uh, common to see. So if we want to find S5 exactly for this geometric series, let's see what we know. We know that T1 is 1 third. We know the common ratio. It's going from a 1 third to a negative 2 thirds. That means it's being multiplied by negative 2. Again, you could take T2 and divide it by T1. Remember that division in a fraction means multiplication by a flip. And we get a common ratio of negative 2. Here, we also know that n is 5, because we want s5. We want the exact value. So we know r, t1, and n. Clearly, this is the one we want to use. So s5 will be t1, which is a third, times r to the n, so negative 2 to the 5, minus 1. Notice that's a big minus 1, all over negative 2 minus 1 or 1 third, uh, negative 2 to the fifth is negative 32, minus 1 would be negative 33, all over negative 3. If I multiply the top, I'll just get negative 11, so negative 11 over negative 3. And as a convention, we don't like negatives on the bottom. Negative divided by a negative is just a positive. Depending on how fancy your calculator is, maybe it would give you that exact value. But we can get there analytically without it. Now that we can do a basic sum question, let's revisit this word problem with Jimmy. Jimmy has this job that pays 47000 in its first year. He's guaranteed a 3% raise every year. And now we want to know how much he makes in total in those first five years. That means it's a sum question. We want to find S5. OK, so we know T1 is 47,000. We know from doing this earlier that the common ratio is 1.03. And we're talking about the first five terms. If we took a look up top and we saw the different formulas, we probably want to use the one on the left. So to set that up, First, I'll just write down the formula. 
Sn is T1 times R to the N. Notice this is a big minus 1 all over R minus 1. S5, that's going to be 47,000 by 1.03 to the power of 5 minus 1 all over 1.03 minus 1. When we put this in our calculator, we have to be careful. If you want to put it in all in one step, you need brackets around the top and the bottom, unless you have a super duper fancy calculator, which may or may not be allowed in the actual exam. So here we go. Let's uh, put this in with those extra brackets. 47,000, 1.03 to the power of 5. Make sure my minus 1 comes down. And it looked like close, close. Okay. Divided by. Now, ideally, I'd just say this is 0 0.03. But let's suppose we didn't have that insight. It gives us 249,000. S5 is 249,529. And that's a great way to approach it. If instead we had wanted to use the other formula, okay, so it would be Sn is R times Tn minus T1 all over R minus 1. We could, because we found out in the last question that T5 um, was 52,898 and 91. Okay, so we could use it. It's not going to be any more efficient. I'll just have this solution pop up here, and you can look at it if you like. So there it is. If we wanted to, uh, we could use either one. Just like for arithmetic sequences and series, which one you use depends on what you know. In this case, we could have used either one. OK, last piece of the puzzle here for chapter 1, infinite geometric series. So if r lies between negative 1 and 1, then each successive term gets smaller. And that means it makes less of a difference in the sum. So in these cases, as n gets large, Sn, the sum, converges on a value. So I started off a little series here, 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth. Obviously, the common ratio in this case is a half. And the sum of the first 10 terms is 1.99. The sum of the first 20 terms is 1.999999. And that's not exact. There are some other decimals that come afterwards. You could expect that the sum of the first infinity terms, well, it looks like it's converging on the number 2. And we can show that that's the case. So as n gets large, Sn tends towards 2 in this series. In other words, the limit of Sn as n gets infinitely large is 2. Now, when you take calculus in grade 12, You'll see that word limit again. So here, we'll stop for a related joke. An infinite number of mathematicians walk up to a, let's say, lemonade stand. The first one orders one lemonade, the second orders half a lemonade, the third orders one quarter of a lemonade, and so on. The server gets two glasses, fills them, and says, you folks really ought to know your limits, lol. Because really, we're looking at two full glasses of lemonade there. So for an infinite geometric series, here is the formula. And again, this one's given to you uh, in your formula sheet. T1 over 1 minus r. It's only true if the numbers are getting smaller and smaller, which means that r is between negative 1 and 1. If r is not between those values, there is no sum. So over here, I've got a T1 of 1. This is the one we just looked at. And a common ratio of a half. Oh, that works. We've got a ratio between negative 1 and positive 1. So we can find the sum of this infinite series. It's t1, which is 1, over 1 minus a half. OK. And 1 minus a half is a half. And division of fractions is multiplication by the reciprocal. So the sum, like we expected it was going to be, is 2. Let's try the next one. We've got t1 of 8. We've got an r here. Oh, it changes from positive to negative, so it's negative. And we've multiplied by negative a quarter. 
Again, we've got a ratio that is between negative 1 and 1. So let's try this one out. The sum, the infinite sum, is 8 over 1 minus negative a quarter. That's 8 over 5 fourths. Or 32 over 5. Okay, flip and multiply. 32 over 5 or 6.4. Let's try a couple of other ones. 1 plus 2 plus 4. So t1 is 1, r is 2. Is that between negative 1 and 1? No, it is not. So this one just increases more and more and more. There is no sum. The next one, we'd have t1 of 8. Oh, it's getting smaller. That's promising. Oh, but it's going down by 3's. This is arithmetic. And there are no sums for our arithmetic series. Okay, so this one, no sum because it's arithmetic. The other one, no sum because r was greater than 1. couple of applications. Suppose we have an oil well that produces 10,000 barrels of oil per week. Production drops 2% each week. Suppose the well were to remain operational forever on this model. How much oil would it produce? Okay, and as you go far into the future, it's going to produce barely any. It's just dropping. So let's see what we know. We know that the first term is 10,000. We know that the ratio is, oh, this is percent decrease. So it's 100%, but it's going down by 2%. R is 98%, or 0 0.98. Forever. <laughs> n is infinity, or n goes to infinity, or something around that. We're thinking about here an infinite sum. And can we do an infinite sum? Absolutely. r is less than 1, so no problem. So s infinity is going to be t1 all over 1 minus r. Okay, we can divide by 0 0.02 or multiply by 50 uh, over 50. That's going to give us a half million. 500,000. One last application would be looking at how we get from repeating decimals into fractions. Because we learned last year that repeating decimals are part of the rational numbers. That means they can all be expressed as fractions. So if we have 0.21, that's really 0.21, 2,1, 2,1, and so on. If we pull this apart, the first position here, this is called tenths. The next one is hundredths. So this much here is 21 over 100. And then we have to add on, OK, so that was the hundredth. This is the thousandths here. This would be the ten thousandths. So 21 over 10,000. And we're at 10,000, so this is the hundred thousandths. This is the millionths. So we'd have to add on 21 over 1 million. And we would keep on doing that indefinitely. That's a series. In fact, it's a geometric series. And it's one that goes on forever. We know that t1 would be 21 over 100. The ratio to get from 100 to 10,000, we're multiplying by 1 over 100. And it's an infinite sum. OK, 1 over 100 is less than 1, so we can use the formula. And I'll just write it one more time. So t1 is 21 over 100. That's all divided by 
1 minus 1 over 100. I'll follow this through. That's 21 over 100 all over 99 over 100. Flip and multiply. Gives us 21 over 99. And that fraction can be reduced. Those are both divisible by 3. So that's going to give us 7 over 33. So that's an overview of the key concepts that are in Chapter 1. I hope that you found this helpful. Uh, good luck with any sort of revision or test that you're doing. And hopefully at some point uh, we'll have some practice problems down in the video description below. Take care.